All right, Ashley, it's on you. Thank you so much, Noble. Um, what a great panel. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the Local Municipal Solutions panel discussion. We're here to talk about ways that cities in Pennsylvania and beyond are reducing exposures to lead through policy action. Um, as Noble said, I'm Ashley Deemer. I'm the Deputy Director of Penn Environment, which is a statewide environmental advocacy organization. We've been involved in the Get the Let Out Pittsburgh campaign and I'll be moderating our discussion. So this is a really exciting conversation because as we've heard today, policy is really the best way to make sure that all kids are protected from lead and decision makers from our region and beyond who may be in our audience today have a lot to learn from those who have already passed legislation and those who are now implementing their laws. Um, we've heard a lot about Pittsburgh and Allegheny County today. We know that hundreds of kids under the age of six are diagnosed with lead poisoning every year in Pittsburgh. Not really surprising given, given our housing stock and the fact that a lot of our drinking water is still delivered by lead pipes, although that is changing, which we've also heard. Um, and thankfully, after years of advocacy on the part of the Get the Lead Out Pittsburgh campaign, we now have some really excellent champions on this issue on city council. And one of them is with us here today to talk about the ordinance that Pittsburgh City Council will debate and hopefully vote on next week. Um, so we're going to hear more from our Pittsburgh champion and learn everything we can from panelists in other cities with comprehensive lead laws. Uh, from Pittsburgh, we have city council person Erica Strasberger. We have folks from Lancaster, Craig Walt, the bureau chief for Lancaster Lead Safety and Community Development. From Philadelphia, we have Colleen McCauley, who is the health policy director for Children First, as well as George Gould, who is the council attorney. Uh, for community legal services in Philadelphia. And from Buffalo, New York, we have Anna Falikov, who is the attorney for the city of Buffalo. So what we're gonna do is have some questions for all panelists. And if we have time, I'm not sure if we will, uh, we'll do our best to take some questions from the audience at the end. So if you do have questions Question. for the panelists, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, so, Without further delay, let's just get into it. We are very interested in learning a little bit about each city's lead ordinance uh, today. Um, so I have already introduced our speakers and then I think we'll give them each three to five minutes to talk about the top lines of how their city's lead policy works, um, how their laws protect residents and their role in passing or implementing these laws. Uh, so let's kick it off with uh, Pittsburgh's own city council person, Erica Strasberger. Council person Strasberger represents Pittsburgh City Council District 8. So council person Strasberger, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you all for being here today and participating in this really, really important summit on a critical issue for uh, the region, really every region in the country, but this region in particular. And um, before I jump into the details of the ordinance we're proposing in Pittsburgh, I wanted to say that on a personal note, this is a really important and momentous time for us to be introducing this because I spent the first 10 years of my career working as an environmental advocate. And the very first campaign I worked on was uh, working to pass federal regulations, urging Congress uh, to cut down on mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. Another neurotoxin that uh, pregnant women and, and babies and children are particularly vulnerable to. And um, just in, as in that case, we were successful in getting federal regulations. Um, we're working city by city, state by state to make that happen with lead as well to reduce the uh, exposure before <clears throat> it's too late. So um, really grateful to be here today. And, you know, also just on a personal note, as a, as a parent myself now, I understand the importance of this even more than I ever did before. I understand how um, how much parents work to protect their children and that you want your home and your, your child care center and your school to be a safe place, not a harmful and poisoning place. So this is, you know, this is personal to me on a number of levels. So the 
ordinance in Pittsburgh is it's similar to many other municipal municipal ordinances across the country. In, fa in fact, was modeled after that. Let me just also say that, you know, this has been done in partnership with the Get the Let Out Coalition. This would not have happened with the, Let the Get the Let Out Coalition and the many organizations that have been a part of that, um, as well as my council colleagues who are equally passionate about this issue. Councilwoman Deb Gross, who has long been an environmental and uh, a lead safety um, um, advocate, uh, dating back to even before her time as a board member of PWSA, but especially then, um, Councilman Bobby Wilson and Councilman Corey O'Connor. I know that there's other support um, among other council members, but those are the other three who have been instrumental in this. And so this would um, protect this bill, or it aims to protect residents from lead exposure um, knowing that there's not one single source of lead exposure, it works to protect um, people from exposure from paint services, renovations, demolitions, and at-risk drinking water supplies. It protects, um, it offers protections in residential housing and occupied facilities caused by re renovations, repairs, or painting activities that disturb services with lead-based paint are, or are presumed to contain lead-based paint. Um, caused by demolitions, commercial and publicly owned structures with lead containing materials, um, lead in the soil, and lead in drinking water. So it's broken down into four main sections, lead safe housing and child occupied facilities. The second is lead safe renovations, repairs, and painting activities. The third is lead safe demolitions, and the fourth is lead safe water lines. So to start with the first one, lead safe housing and child occupied facilities, this section would require our city's Department of Permits, Permits, Licenses and Inspections, also called PLI, to add to their typical inspection protocols, lead safe assessments in a building built before 1978 and used as a residential um, dwelling or child occupied facility. <clears throat> so that would include everything from a visual assessment for bare soil on the lots, um, to a visual assessment for deteriorated paint surfaces inside, outside the house, um, or common areas, lead, lead dust wipes sampling inside any dwelling, and a visual assessment for leaded plumbing fixtures. Um, this is a section that we are sort of in the midst of figuring out because our rental registry that would allow for these kinds of interior inspections um, that was passed by city council more than six years ago has been challenged in the courts and i think we're hopefully very close to getting that over the finish line in the courts but um, some of this hinges on that passing so that's just one kind of sticking point to be to to note the second section the lead safe renovations repairs and painting activities so um, as we know renovations are a major source of lead poisoning so it's a Essential that these are regulated and performed in a way to protect occupiers of renovated and repair spaces. So PLI would require the permit applicant to affirm their understanding of the risks of disturbing paint in buildings built before 1978 and make information available regarding the risks. Um, in addition, it re required that licensed contractors who get a license from the city of Pittsburgh would need to be lead renovation, repair, and painting RRP certified. But this would also work to capture people who aren't getting licenses to be contractors who are maybe doing work on their own home. Um, they would need to affirm that they are um, that they know how to do work in a lead safe manner and help to educate them. <clears throat> lead safe demolitions, this section would require the city and city funded demolitions to be carried out in a lead safe manner pursuant to a city approved demolition work plan. And that is everything from wetting structures down with water, uh, minimizing the amount of dust that enters the air, as well as removing contaminated topsoil and plant um, ground covering vegetation. Um, we're also engaging in a, a, a as part of a, an executive order from the from Mayor Peduto, but also it's part of the ordinance, a um, a pilot project on deconstruction. To the, so to the extent possible, deconstructing buildings and reusing them prior to demolition. Um, fourth section is the lead safe drinking water. As you've heard, if you've heard um, some of the panels before this, um, for the majority of people who are uh, PWSA customers in the city of Pittsburgh, um, sorry, let me just rephrase that. The majority of people who live in Pittsburgh are served by the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority. And for those who are those customers, 
they are in the midst of experiencing a major transformation from um, lead service lines to a full eradication and removal of lead service lines by 2026. However, there are some people, many people actually served by um, other public utilities or water, water companies. So this ordinance calls on, uh, it urges them to ensure that they are doing uh, lead line replacements similar to the way PWSA is, and also calls on the city of Pittsburgh to ensure that our own drinking water outlets used in city owned or funded um, residential or child occupied facilities are filtered to capture lead and urges our schools, um, our Pittsburgh public schools to do the same. I will leave it at that because uh, I've probably gone over time, but I wanted to um, to to delve into our our ordinance as much as possible, and I look forward to the future conversation and questions. Thank you. That is super helpful. Thank you so much, Councilperson. Um, we are going to move right over to Craig Walt, who is the Bureau Chief for Lancaster Lead Safety and Community Development. Thank you so much for being here, Craig, and we'd love to hear more about your work and the laws on lead in Lancaster. You have about three to five minutes. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Really appreciate the opportunity to join the panel um, this afternoon just to share a little bit about what's happening in the city of Lancaster. Um, so I'll do my best to sum that up in an elevator pitch here. Um, so just a little bit about my role with the city of Lancaster. Um, I oversee the city's federal entitlement programs, including uh, Community Development Block Grant, the Home Investments Partnership Program, as well as a few other programs, including the city's um, HUD Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes Grant Program. And so since I've started with the city, I've also been working to support um, policy development efforts related to lead poisoning prevention. Um, for a little background, in 2017, the city of Lancaster adopted an ordinance um, requiring rental properties to obtain and maintain a lead safe certification that's valid for two years and that that's required for all pre-78 rental properties with occupants, um, with child occupants that are age six and under. Even prior to this ordinance in 2017, the city had um, mechanisms in place for uh, EBLL enforcement activities. So over the last uh, few years, the city's observed um, some challenges with this model, uh, including um, you know, difficulties with compliance, lack of an objective way to verify the age of the occupants um, when licensing and inspecting. Um, and we, also, we all know that placing um, additional or specific requirements only on properties with young children living in them can lead to housing discrimination. Um, and we also know that people um, move and there can be frequent turnover in rental properties. So all of these things has uh, have really moved us to explore expanding and improving the ordinance uh, to better ensure lead safe housing for all families. Um, and additionally, we engaged uh, GHHI, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, to work with the city in reviewing our current ordinance and, uh, and to develop proposed updates based on the leading best practices. Um, and along the way, we were also able to follow the work of um, occurring in other communities, especially um, what's been happening in Philadelphia. So that's really been helpful to inform our local efforts. And so now in 2021, we're in the process of proposing an amended ordinance that would expand the lead safe certification requirements to all pre-78 rental properties. Um, we also aim to strengthen our EBLL case response by increasing the city's authority um, to ensure that we're notified about all EBLL cases, um, to ensure that the environmental investigation is performed for each case. Um, and then in critical circumstances, be able to actually condemn a property for children under age six to ensure um, to ensure that the child, um, if they have extreme lead poisoning and or are undergoing chelation, um, to ensure that they can't return to that property until the lead hazards are remediated. So we presented this concept to city council in early September. Now we're in the midst of our community engagement period with stakeholders and the general public. Um, and then we'll be providing some updates back to city council during the November and December sessions. We originally planned to have some legislation um, ready 
uh, for that timeline. But at this point, most likely um, we're looking at uh, the beginning of 2022 to introduce the legislative updates. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, great to hear about everything happening in Lancaster, and we'll dig into that more in a few minutes. Um, next, we're going to hear from our folks in Philadelphia. We're going to head east. Um, we have two folks here from Philadelphia. We have George Gould, who is a senior attorney at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia. And we have Colleen McCauley, who is the health policy director at Children First, the greater Philadelphia region's leading child advocacy organization. So let's go ahead and start with Jewel, or George. Do you want to um, give us a quick intro, George, of uh, what what's going on in Philly with your lead ordinance and your involvement there? And again, if we can keep it to three to five minutes, that would be very helpful. I'm glad to be here with everybody today. Hopefully we'll get George back in. Um, he was instrumental to getting the, the law, Philly's law, amended and strengthened. Right, I'm from Kids Children's First. We are a kids advocacy and policy organization working in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I'm also helping to lead a statewide effort, the Lead Free Promise Project, um, which I'll have a chance to share with more about that with folks um, at the end of today's summit. Um, so, yeah, so you heard a little bit from Craig already. Um, Philadelphia passed a lead certification law back in 2011 requiring landlords with properties built before 1978 to have them tested for lead and um, to have that certificate updated um, you know, every two years and ensure that it was updated at the at time of turnover. And um, shortly after, um, that's the gist of it, shortly after, this is not the law that we, uh, that advocates asked to be passed uh, because it only applied to children six and under. It's not what we asked for, you know, but that is what uh, did finally get passed. And soon after, um, we found what we expected, that the law was pretty much unenforceable because there's no record of where a child, uh, the age of the tenant in a property. And uh, because um, the certificate was required to be you know, updated when the, when the property turned over. And again, there's no record. The city doesn't have a record of when tenants come and go. Um, so. Uh, we found that uh, over uh, like a five or six year period or so, only about 25% of the estimated houses that should have been tested were tested. So in 2019, we were able to um, get an amendment to the law passed to, uh, to strengthen the law. So now um, all pre-1978 rental properties in the city of Philadelphia are required to be tested for lead and the, that certificate uh, uh, is required um, when you go to initiate a rental license, get your rental license for the first time, and when you go to renew your rental license, because that is a transaction that happens with the city. Um, and uh, so this law like it was passed again in fall, this amended strength in law was passed in 2019. Um, I don't have a lot of data to share with you about how it's going. It was also, a, uh, it's been implemented in a, um, in a gradual way. The top um, zip codes impacted by lead poisoning had to comply first. Uh, so not all zip codes are complying just yet, but we will uh, within a year. Um, and I will say in this effort to get the law strengthened took us about three years and I'd be happy to share some of our experiences getting it strengthened. Um, I do want to move on and keep this moving um, and uh, move over to Buffalo, to New York, um, and hear from Anna Falikov, um, who is the Assistant Corporation Counsel in the City of Buffalo's Law Department. Um, welcome, Anna, and thank you for being here. Thanks, everyone. It's an honor to be with uh, neighboring state Pennsylvania. Um, I'm glad to share our experience passing our lead ordinance, which we really characterize as a proactive rental inspection ordinance because we're oriented not just on lead, but other threats to health and safety. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of context. We have, uh, much like uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, a serious problem with lead related to our old housing stock uh, and poverty of our residents and deferred maintenance of, house, of the housing. Uh, but our 
the primary uh, rental housing type in the city of Buffalo is the single and double Victorian. But those units up until recently were not regularly inspected. We had our apartment buildings that were subject to a certificate of occupancy inspection, but the single and double was not. So we determined uh, with our lead safe task force, it sounds like many of you have a similar type organization. Um, we determined that we needed to really study the problem and understand where uh, lead poisoning occurs and what we needed to do to fix the problem. Not surprisingly, it was the rental single and double, the very place that we weren't regulating. And the recommendation that came out of a report in 2018 was to pass a law mandating regular inspections. So uh, our inspections process requires that uh, every three years, the unit pass a basic health and safety uh, inspection. Uh, we're doing a visual assessment for chipping and peeling paint. If there's deteriorated paint, we require that the paint be remediated using an RRP certified contractor and a lead dust wipe uh, be taken post remediation. Um, upon completion of that inspection, the property will be issued what we're calling a certificate of rental compliance. So it's not a certificate of occupancy indicating that the property is 100 percent code, code compliant, but it passes a, a lower standard for uh, for basic health and safety. We 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 concluded that we couldn't go from zero to 100 with you know these properties had not been regulated. Uh, you know only our code enforcement officials were only responding to complaints in the past. So to go to require them to be 100% code compliant, we felt was unreasonable, at least in this first go around. Um, we also concluded that uh, we really needed to have resources uh, available to our landlords who are small for the most part and undercapitalized, um, particularly this year, right post or not post, but during COVID, um, when rents haven't been coming in as they normally would. So uh, before we launched our initiative and passed our law, we worked really hard to obtain a new uh, lead hazard control grant from HUD. We have, we're uh, launching a revolving loan fund that's oriented to landlords uh, that has a low interest loan product with a grant component to it. Um, and we have a couple of other new resources so that we could say, you know what, we're coming into your units with a stick, but we really want, our goal is compliance. And we want you to fix, remediate your units uh, with our assistance if you need it. Um, the last thing I'll add is that, you know, we we identified one of our problems as being our backend enforcement challenge, where uh, most of our code violations get written up for court after a landlord has not demonstrated, you know, any interest in moving forward, substantial interest. But our cases were lingering in court. Uh, the judge was adjourning cases regularly. And just to serve a defendant uh, could take months. Um, so we're working on an administrative enforcement system so that property owners are ticketed. And when they receive a ticket, if they fail to comply, they, we can bring them into City Hall, adjudicate the case, again, trying to connect them to resources, taking what we're calling a restorative approach. Um, and only after failure to make any progress will we proceed with, you know, fines and judgments and potentially transferring to housing court. So we, you know, as I say to my colleagues, you know, there's like a lot of different ingredients to bake the cake and some are stronger than others or more tasty. I don't really know how to extend that analogy appropriately, but anyhow, uh, you know, we're, we're getting there. Uh, I'd say uh, we passed our law a year ago. We launched our inspections this fall. Um, we're taking baby steps. We're very committed to working with our community partners to make sure that we address challenges along the way and that we get into units, which is a big challenge for us. Um, uh, given the level of distrust, I think that we uh, have been encountering with tenants and landlords. So I'm glad to uh, you know, answer any questions and participate in the larger panel discussion. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Anna, and to all of our panelists for doing the quick and dirty run through of what you have going on in your cities. Um, so let's bring all of our panelists together. Um, Often as an organizer who works on this issue, I advise people to talk about the bit, the vision and the big picture because those are the things that really compel people to take action, in my opinion, towards social change. But 
Here, I think we have a unique audience of practitioners and hopefully decision makers. And I think it's really valuable to get into the weeds a little bit, um, into the details of how these laws came to be, what challenges uh, folks here have encountered. And we've talked a little bit about that already. Um, but, you know, what dig into what you've done to overcome challenges and what you'd recommend for people who may not be as far along in the process. So I'm going to kick off a series of questions to that end. Um, and uh, we'll go through and make sure every one has time to answer. Um, first, I really want to dig into the challenges that sometimes stand in the way of policy solutions, and that could take a variety of forms. Um, you know, for Pittsburgh's part, we um, coalition partners worked for years to really hone in on what the right ordinance was and address different operational and budget concerns and then elevate the issue in a political way. So, um, you know, that's just one example. But I, I'd love to hear more from panelists about the biggest challenges in passing and amending these laws um, and implementation as well. And how, do you do, how did you overcome some of the political and legislative and operational barriers? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Councilperson Strasburger because Pittsburgh is the thing I'm most familiar with. And I know that your bill was just introduced this week and it's going to be discussed sometime early next week. Um, but could you describe some of the challenges that you've encountered in creating this bill and thinking about how it gets implemented um, and how, how you got to this point and overcame those things? Thanks, Ashley. I just have to smile a little bit because I recall meeting with the Get the Let Out Coalition members, I think it was September or August in 2019, and the ask was, do you think we could get this over the finish line by the end of the year? And I said, sure, no problem. We'll get it done through the budget season. And here we are two years later, now just introducing it. So um, I think that, you know, there are a couple of main challenges. One is any anytime you introduce something new, and it's, it appears to be an unfunded mandate, the question is, well, where are we going to find the funding and the bandwidth to be able to actually implement and operationalize this? This is a really, really big lift for our um, code enforcement officials. And it takes everything from retraining to hiring staff to upgrading technology. And with a city, regardless of the size of the city, that can take, you know, that can take years in and of itself to, to do and to accomplish. So we have to be mindful of the needs of the department who will bear the greatest sort of burden of implementing this. <clears throat> uh, fortunately, we, because of the time that we took to sort of work through these concerns and work through the legal concerns, which we are actually still in the midst of doing, I have to be very upfront, we're working very closely with our law department and going back and forth to make sure that we're amending the bill to make it appropriate for Pittsburgh. Um, we have seen a, a, an influx of, um, of federal support to cities in the form of the American Rescue Plan. So we were able to, as through the city's allocation of the American Rescue Plan funds, city council allocated $17.5 million to the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority for their ongoing effort to replace lead lines. Um, and meet their, their goal, and $2 million to implement what was at that point a placeholder for this bill. So we have $2, $2 million to work with. The estimates that our partners um, at the National Center for Healthy Housing have put together for Pittsburgh seems seem to point to about $2 million to implement this year one. And there are more upfront costs than there are um, going to be in subsequent years, but that's a major hurdle. So we need to uh, continue to identify funding sources for keeping the implementation of this going beyond year one. Um, the second one I mentioned is already is um, rental registration or rental registry program, which uh, would, similar to as we've heard in other cities, move from a request format for inspections, um, mostly outside and exterior inspections from our, our code enforcement officials, <clears throat> to a proactive rental inspection interior as well. And that's going to be a huge lift once it's, um, I say once, but hopefully as it passes through the court system and succeeds and we, we are able to implement in 2022, uh, be a huge lift to get that off the ground and the lead component will be just one of those, but um, I see that has, as having been the question mark of that being in the courts as a hurdle. 
for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you for that rundown of challenges here in Pittsburgh. We have a lot of things to work on, uh, especially over the next few weeks. Um, uh, let's move to Craig. Uh, Craig, can you get into some of the challenges you faced in Lancaster and how you moved past them? I know you mentioned a couple things um, about um, compliance being a challenge and wanting to avoid housing discrimination. Yeah. and. And one of the first things that comes to mind for me is the operational challenges and really looking at how we continue to implement this and what are the opportunities to improve our processes along with these updates. Um, so as we're looking to amend the ordinance, we're considering kind of two main channels, one of which we would basically expand the existing lead safe certification requirements and the current process to obtain and submit the certification. Um, so we're one option is to just simply expand the existing system. At the same time, we're also considering changes to our overall um, rental systematic inspection schedule and licensing schedule. And so along with that, it's kind of bringing up another opportunity to consider different models and processes to obtain and submit the lead safe certifications that might improve efficiency and our ability to um, oversee this and ensure compliance. But we know that if we introduce a new process, this might also create some challenges for property owners that have already grown accustomed to our current model. The other thing that comes to mind is timing and capacity. Um, there's still so much happening uh, as communities continue to respond to COVID-19 while also focusing on um, you know, various community recovery efforts. And so while we're discussing these proposed changes, we're also working to advance other major initiatives related to safe and affordable housing, um, or as was already mentioned, planning related to ARPA funding. So capacity and sometimes competing interests can be a challenge um, because advancing legislation really does take a lot of time and effort. Um, and there's also only so much you can plan for. Um, and as you move forward, there's uh, it comes to light that there's a lot out of your control. For sure. Thank you for that. Um, everyone's keeping really good time. We're moving right along here. Um, thank you to the panelists for that. Um, uh, you know, Colleen, I, I don't think we have George here, um, but I know, you know, I know Philadelphia's lead ordinance is quite comprehensive um, and it, it ensures that every rental property in Philadelphia is certified lead safe or lead free. And I wonder if you have encountered challenges with um, enforcement or some pushback from property owners or any other challenges that you faced. I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. Um, in getting the law amended and strengthened uh, in 2019, um, that was, I would say that was our greatest challenge. Um, a, a, a group of uh, folks who didn't want to see the law become universal, and some of the most outspoken folks who opposed it were prop rental property owners. Um, and in particular, um, uh, their, the concern was that the cost to test and then, of course, to remediate if hazards were found, were going to in, you know increase the cost to um, run their business, um, and uh, that cost would be have to be turned over to the tenant and uh, affordable housing would become extinct uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, that was uh, one of the major concerns and challenges. And um, we had evidence to the contrary. You know, we had, there was evidence in the state of Maryland who, uh, again, uh, um, in the state of Maryland, they had a law on the books uh, for 30 years. And we looked particularly at Baltimore, you know, Balt uh, another you know big city in the state of Maryland, and uh, very clearly that um, there was that didn't happen um, in the city of Baltimore or across the state of Maryland. Um, it did not significantly impact the availability of affordable housing, um, 
And so um, we, uh, so I would say, so that was a, a great challenge. And we met that challenge um, by uh, taking on some, some uh, strategies that I think most folks are going to um, find familiar, right? So we had to have a good, strong coalition. Um, our powers in number, and we, our numbers, the power in numbers, and we had um, coalition members who were also rental property owners, right? Um, it was really important that we had good, accurate data and research and publish that data. That was important as well. So our coalition, our data, um, our and, um, very strong communications campaign to be able to amplify that data and the, the stories of these children and healthcare providers and um, fair housing folks. Um, and then to do all the outreach to the public, to our um, to our uh, our lawmakers, and to people who influence those lawmakers. Those are some important strategies we undertook. That makes a lot of sense. I just want to dive right into that, but we'll <laughs> we'll go through the panel, um, and uh, I'd love to hear from Anna. Um, you know. You've mentioned um, in Buffalo that landlords are typically smaller operations, they're undercapitalized. Um, I'd love to hear if there was opposition or, or just general concerns from your city council about that and how you address that. And I also, you know, I heard Craig mention COVID-19, and we haven't really talked about that much here, but I know your implementation has only just begun, I think, because of COVID-19. So I'd love to hear more about that and, and how you dealt with those things. Sure. Well, one of the, the not surprising things, but realities of uh, small landlords is that they're not very well organized. So um, there was no organized opposition to our ordinance. Um, but in a way, I wish we had had an engagement period with landlords uh, uh, prior and post. I mean, that's, that's a big challenge we face is educating landlords um, and getting to some extent their buy-in. You know, we know that uh, there will be resistance among those who simply don't want to partake in any kind of government regulation, but there are others and I have met a few uh, who say, you know what, this is good for us because it creates a level playing field. We want our certificate of rental compliance to show that this property is safe. Um, and it's about time, you know, like, is this is a business, like, you know, it should be safe and healthy. Um, certainly heard the concern about passing costs on to tenants. Um, and that is a concern. Uh, but I always like what Amanda Reddy from the National Center for Health, the National Center for uh, Healthy Housing says is, no one should ever have to choose between safety and affordability. It is a reality right on the ground, but we're working very hard to make these grants and loans available to landlords. So we're ready for them, for their concerns. Um, COVID-19, you know, the, the many impacts, obviously one, one was entering into units. We, we had a, a small pilot prior to this fall and it shut down almost entirely due to concerns about interactions between inspectors and residents. Um, but I think the the challenge now is uh, certainly the concern about rents not coming in, uh, and in many instances, really bad relationships between tenants and landlords that have were no were not was good, but they certainly got worse this year um, with the eviction moratorium in effect, where many tenants stopped paying rent, um, and landlords resent that um, for better or for worse. So we're entering into a kind of a fraught relationship. Um, where we need the consent of landlords and tenants to let us in. So those are the main, those are our challenges, you know, responsive to those questions, Ashley. Um, and I just, I'll say, Erica, that our, the internal capacity continues to be the biggest challenge we face. You know, like you like you were stating, I think so well, code enforcement has to actually implement, right, what we write on paper. And so I did my best, right, to be in consultation with them all throughout our legislative process. Um, but nevertheless, you know, uh, they're struggling and they will continue to struggle um, without additional funding and support. That is super helpful. Um, thank you all for answering the, the hardest question, the challenges question. Um, 
You know, I think for a lot of folks who might be listening today, they're not even at that point yet. You know, they um, they haven't started advocating um, or as decision makers, they haven't thought about what an ordinance would look like yet. And for question two, I'd love to get into some advice for people who are just starting out and trying to trying to examine this issue in their communities and what could be helpful and um, and how to get started organizing some kind of push for policy. So I'd love to hear from you all um, about first steps that you recommend. I understand that you're not all advocates or organizers, but you know, hindsight is a wonderful learning tool. And so from your perspectives, it would be great to hear kind of what you imagine as the ideal kickoff for uh, starting from scratch on something like this in another municipality. Um, and we'll start again in the same order with Councilperson Strasburger. I know, again, you're on the legislative side of this and not the advocacy side, but you were an advocate for many years. And so I think you have some good perspective here. Um, I'd love to hear you know, what you think would be helpful from groups um, in other municipalities and getting started. Absolutely. It's, um, I'm not going to say that this is the way that you have to do it, but what I found to be, what we found here in Pittsburgh was that through actually the University of Pittsburgh Institute of Politics, which ha which brings together thought leaders on various issues, they actually focused in on lead. When lead became um, a really hot button issue in the news, when our water supplies, it came to be known that our water supplies were threatened i wouldn't say in the same for the same reason as as flint but in the same way as flint um there was everyone began focusing on lead in the city of pittsburgh and in the region which was a good thing because this is the result now many years later um institute of politics convened everyone who works on this issue studied it came out with a recommendation report and this is sort of countywide and the benefit of that was then there was a coalition of groups that included our county health department who you've heard from that included advocacy groups that included members of the government and university scholars um so that we we weren't surprising anyone or leaving anyone out i was actually not not part of that process but that was that created a coalition. Um, from there, the advocacy arm um, or a new coalition get the, get the Let Out Coalition formed to implement a piece of that, which is a city ordinance that could then perhaps be a model for other municipalities nearby. And um, when they first approached city council about introducing an ordinance, I think many of us said, in reality, we try to work day in and day out, serving our constituents. Sometimes the reality is that writing legislation, you know, despite what people think we do for a living, writing legislation gets put to the wayside. If you all as the advocates can work together pr to present us with what you think is model ordinance from your perspective, that would be helpful. So they did that and they worked for many, many months, brought us back uh, sample legislation. And that's sort of what we've been working on and through with our own lawyers at the city and with our um, our code enforcement officials ever since to bring it to fruition and introduction. So that was a process in Pittsburgh. And I would say that that was from a public official's perspective. It was incredibly, it was incredibly um, helpful and valuable to have, um, to have advocates who had already put the thought into it and also had access to data from our county health department because one challenge we didn't I didn't mention but in in Pittsburgh having the challenge of a city government that is not one and the same as a county government like Philadelphia has or other cities have presents a challenge so having access to the data from the county having access to data from other um, sources was um, was also just incredibly incredibly useful as a as a public elected official helping to implement this. Thanks. That's such a good point. I think um, I think often advocates and organizers uh, don't think about just drafting the policy, right? Um, you imagine this is something that legislators do, um, and the reality is at the local level. A lot of city council people like yourself are getting tons of constituent calls. There's a lot of urgent issues that you're juggling. Um, I often say that all of the all of the problems flow downhill. So it really the buck stops at city council, and often um, 
you know, it really does help to bring in that legal expertise from um, from the coalition, uh, legal expertise, policy expertise, data, as you were saying. So that is such a good point. Um, how about you, Craig? Um, how would you suggest that people get together and begin advocating for this? What What was effective in Lancaster, and what do you, or what do you think could have been done differently? So. Uh, Erica touched on this at the end of her comments about the importance of data um, and working with your local health department. Um, so getting data is really essential, um, you know, helps highlight the issues, helps tell a story, um, and then even can be used to help uh, direct the available resources. And so prior to joining the city of Lancaster, I actually worked for the York City Bureau of Health in York, Pennsylvania, um, which is an Act 315 local health department. So we um, had ready access to um, lead poisoning data. And so now I'm kind of at the other end of the spectrum working for the city of Lancaster. And so overall, we're under the jurisdiction of the State Department of Health because we do not have a local health department in our area. So data is, uh, you know, really important to start off with. I also think having lead hazard remediation programs already in place prior to implementing any kind of lead safe inspection and certification requirements is really important. I think this holds true for most policy driven interventions that it's also important to have things in place that support compliance with the new policy. Um, and especially when we're talking about, um, you know, housing for low to moderate income families, um, you know, and preserving and expanding safe and affordable housing, um, you know, these kinds of things often, you know, require some form of subsidy. So right now where we're at in our amendment process, the city has a high impact neighborhoods, uh, lead hazard control and healthy homes grant from HUD for um, $9.7 million. And then just recently, LGH Penn Medicine um, announced their recent investment of $50 million over the next 10 years for lead hazard control. So those two things have really helped us articulate that we have a lot of resources available in our community um, to help fund remediation work. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, moving over to Philadelphia, I would really love to hear, I don't, I wanna keep it an open question. And if there are things that you think is are helpful starting out, please, by all means, I'd love to hear Colleen. The thing that I'm laser focused on is your coalition that you mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what kinds of groups came to the table for that. And I'd love to hear your perspective on what makes the coalition powerful and effective. Uh, I'd love to answer the question about, um, uh, and, and see if there, I'd love to answer the question that other folks answered about uh, if you're just getting started. And then if I have time, I'd, I'd love to talk about the coalition. You tell me. Um, what I would say about that is, it, you know, if, again, if you're just thinking about your municipality getting started, um, uh, I, my suggestion would be to look and see what powers already exist in the municipality. So go and take a look at the ordinances in your municipality to see what exists. Chances are there is some kind of requirement that uh, properties cannot have chipping or peeling paint in them. Um, and you may be surprised to find that's the case. And then if that is the case, then to, to work with your existing powers that you already have to go ahead and enforce, to, you know, to go ahead and enforce um, that, uh, uh, that chipping and peeling paint is, um, not, um, is not permitted. Um, and uh, start with what you have. And if what you have isn't strong enough, then to go ahead and begin to think, you know, uh, how, how do we need to, how could we modify the, uh, the existing powers um, to uh, be more protective for children? And what I would also say is you can call me. Um, you can call Amanda Reddy at the National Center for Healthy Housing. She's and her team are expert in helping folks who are just getting started figure out how to make their ordinances more protective. The other thing I would also say is, I, uh, and uh, again, you're going to hear more about this, but um, please uh, join the Lead Free Promise Project, the statewide project. Most all of the folks on this panel participate there. So um, we're there to you know, have conversations about um, uh, how to help folks get started. And we have data and we have help. Um, Craig suggest, uh, I think it was Craig just said suggestions about um, uh, having dollars 
um, you know, having HUD dollars. And so folks in the Lead Free Promise Project um, can also uh, help we have uh, people apply. Most of the HUD grantees in the state participate in the Lead Free Promise Project. So we've got a really rich resource for folks who are beginning to think about uh, ordinances. That makes a ton of sense. Don't reinvent the wheel. There are people who are glad to hand over everything that we've learned um, in forums like this or, um, you know, just one on one conversations even. So, um, uh, folks have a lot of other people to rely on in that way. Um, we have a little more time. I would love to hear about the coalition and just, um, because I think that is one of the first steps, like gathering your partners and, um, figuring out who's going to be with you in this, not fight, but, um, in this work. So the Philly coalition has been, really effective. And I'd love to hear about the different kinds of groups that came together for that. Cause I think it's it, the coalition's diversity might be its strength. And I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for asking. I think that, um, right. So we, again, uh, built the coalition over time. Um, and I think folks would recognize kind of usual, uh, natural partners, right? So individuals who have the lived experience, you know, who are impacted. So these are parents and grandparents um, to participate. And they are, uh, in the, they are um, healthcare providers and social service providers that work with these families um, that have this experience. Um, they are folks like um, George Gould, uh, who unfortunately um, we can't hear on this session, who are lawyers who can write um, the language for the law and provide other expertise. We had several um, public interest law, um, folks from public interest law um, firms join us. Um, and uh, again, um, having uh, rental property owners um, who, who, who think, yes, this is the cost of doing business. No, of course I don't wanna harm a child in my property. So um, now that was a heavy lift, I have to say, in a, in, for us in Philadelphia. Um, and um, it's also about um, ultimately who is influencing our city council members and, and also, so who influences them and how to highlight some of the, um, so who, I'll just stay there for a second. Um, so this is an environmental justice issue and I know we've been talking about this today. So we had um, the NAACP come on to support this effort and the Women's Law Center in Philadelphia because these are mostly single moms. Um, who are running these properties and who are being discriminated against in Philadelphia. Um, again, the, the original law was just for six and under. Um, so uh, bringing on those partners who, um, who can see um, the, uh, who can speak to um, the discriminatory nature of what was, was going on. There's, you know, also power, um, you know, your remediators, um, especially your painters union. That was, if you've got unions, Right? They bring a lot of power. They have a lot of capacity also to be um, speaking to, um, to come with you on your meetings to talk to lawmakers. Um, uh, so we did, we had the, uh, the local painters union. Um, and so those were, um, uh, I would say those were some key folks to think about who is influencing, um, you know, the, the policy makers is an important thing to consider. So awesome to hear about. Thank you, Colleen. And sorry for the double question. I just had to hear it. Um, uh, Anna, I know you're coming at from this, maybe from a slightly different perspective in how the Buffalo law was developed. Um, you were really in-house there, it seems, um, working, working to develop that um, internally. But I, I'd be curious your thoughts on this question of how, um, you know, what tips people can take away from this for getting started in their own city. Uh, I think a lot of really great tips have been shared. Certainly looking at the existing ordinance is key um, and the coalition. I mean, we, we have had our Let's uh, Safe Task Force uh, around for about 10 years, uh, but it strengthened in the last three years thanks to um, the report I mentioned. I think that the report which included data analysis um, from the County Health Department. It really gave a focus to the coalition and it gave a path forward and sort of a guide to advocates as to what to ask for um, and 
and at the same time, it's just it's a good moment. There are a number of cities pursuing these same proactive rental inspection ordinances. So we, when the city receives the report and saw the recommendations, it wasn't a foreign language. You know, we could sort of understand um, that this is the path that many other cities have taken. Certainly, our neighbors down the highway in Rochester are 30 years ahead of us in many respects, and we've always looked to them. Um, but the report and the best practices were useful. Um, so coalition data, looking at what exists, I, I'll uh, reiterate that those are all excellent first steps. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, you know, I feel like we could sit here for another hour and get like, just crack your brains wide open and learn so much from you all. Um, I really want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, this has been fantastic. I hope the audience, um, sees how special this is to have all of you as advocates and practitioners here sharing what you know about how, you know, the process, how this gets done. Um, and I hope you've inspired some folks here to um, get deeper into the work uh, and seek more conversations like this with, um, with you and other folks who are doing um, these kinds of um, laws in their cities. So thank you again um, for everything you've done and for joining us today. Um, and thanks to Women for a Healthy Environment for having me as a panelist today. I think to keep the conference moving, we're going to wrap this up. Um, but again, thanks so much for joining us and uh, take care, everyone. <laughs>